Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really fantastic and, and deliberately uh, small and, and contained uh, panel. Uh, we were looking to have a serious conversation about the future of Afghanistan from the perspective of what Pakistan and the U.S. are doing, have done, and can do in the future. This is obviously a very, very sensitive topic. Uh, people are dying in Afghanistan every day, um, and there is a growing uh, sense of fear, uncertainty, uh, violence, all of those things at the same time. Just today, there was a news item I just read this in the Washington Post that in Badakhshan province, um, a group of protesters uh, gathered to demand electricity and running water. Uh, this is not something we're unfamiliar with in this part of the world. Uh, and during the protest, the guards of the uh, governor uh, shot live ammunition into the crowd, killing uh, three Afghans. Uh, this is kind of salt on the wounds that, you know, we've been watching Afghan society uh, endure over the last several months as dozens of journalists have been killed. There's a generic sense of uncertainty and confusion about, uh, you know, the Taliban and what they want. And in all of this, obviously, the Pakistani and the U.S. government have been working very hard to ensure that the Taliban stay at the table. Uh, many Afghans are, are angry, many Afghans are concerned, and many Afghans are hopeful about this process. Uh, maybe, Aisha, since this region is really, uh, you know, is made up of young people, and, and I think that not to box you in as a young person, but also as somebody who is currently in Afghanistan, uh, maybe, Aisha, you could, before we get started with the kind of the foreign policy element of this discussion and the security element, just describe to us, and I'm going to ask Omar to do the same thing, and then we'll dive into uh, more of the bilateral or trilateral dynamic here. But maybe, Aisha, you could speak a little bit and, and just explain to, to us what it is like living in Afghanistan right now, how you feel, how your friends feel, how your family feels, and, and what the general mood in Afghanistan is. Aisha. Thank you very much, Musharraf, uh, for, ha for having me in today's uh, very important and timely discussion. Um, well, the fact that uh, we have this discussion um, today, um, it, it makes me glad because um, we have very few um, and discussions and analysis about the future of Afghanistan situated and, and the context of um, this region in, in in relation with its neighboring countries and um, well coming to to the current situation I will start with that um, as you mentioned there is a shift of ground um, after the United States um, very sudden uh, shift of policy from uh, a condition based withdrawal to a calendar based withdrawal of US troops and this made me shocked and disappointed. Uh, and, and it made all Afghans very, very disappointed because the peace process did not reach a concrete result so far. And this decision is made uh, at a time when um, everything is left uncertain after the United States um, uh, agreement with Taliban. And right now, um, um, what the general expectation was um, actually uh, about the peace process was the fact that uh, Afghan people wanted the peace process to bear fruit and, and um, to promise a sustainable peace and security for the future of Afghanistan and then see the United States and, um, and the NATO troops withdraw from the country. Uh, United States, of course, they have to withdraw uh, sooner or later. There's no question about it. There's no doubt about it. But um, the United States is now withdrawing Afghan people, withdrawing from Afghanistan and leaving Afghan people with an uncertain future. Um, while the insurgency, while the terrorism significantly increased since their intervention, while the promises they have made um, are left undone, and right now, this uh, unconditional decision of withdrawing U.S. troops, um, it actually created a win and lose mentality and this um, whole peace. Now, the escalation of violence, it's, it's uh, used as a tool of increased leverage by the warring parties on the ground. And as you rightly mentioned, um, civilians are paying the highest price for that. And and the most significant, uh, the most significant um, a sacrifice of this increased violence uh, we can see right now 
um, is the most vulnerable segment of our society who is uh, paying the highest price, young people and children. And the recent sign of it could be seen in the attack on Said al-Shahada school and um, where we actually lost hundreds of um, small children and, and the attack on my university where um, we lost the most brilliant students and as we are continuing to lose more students, more young people and more children, we are also continuing to bury a part of Afghanistan's hope, a part of Afghanistan's future and this massive graveyard of innocent civilians. And it's happening exactly at the time when the United States decided to withdraw no matter what, decided to have unconditional um, and rushed um, uh, withdrawal of its troops. Um, but the main um, thing about um, uh, this discussion, uh, which I like to to highlight, is the fact that United States and Pakistan they both have um, leverage on Taliban, and at this moment in time, um, what all Afghan people expect uh, from the parties engaged in this process is to see um, um, a very significant amount of pressure put on the Taliban to commit to a comprehensive ceasefire, and it's not just because we want. Um, decrease in the violence. You also want the um, peace negotiations to go hand in hand with the peace process, which is the process, the process of reconciliation, reintegration and recon reconstruction, which is which is uh, needed at this moment on the ground. And it's it is disrupted because of the increased level of violence. Um, so right now, how Afghan people feel, how young people feel, they feel angry and frustrated. Um, but the fact that um, one party, um, one one party to this conflict, one party to to the Afghan peace process, feels frustrated, and that's why they are withdrawing, uh, doesn't mean the war end because the party is frustrated. Um, we, as Afghan people who live here, who study here, we are more frustrated than the United States. We want this war to end as soon as possible, but withdrawing unconditionally, unilaterally irresponsibly it doesn't end the war right here um so th um, that's it for now i i would like to um I was, i'm looking forward to more discussion tonight thank you thank you asha that uh, i think that's a that's a great start and and thank you for setting it up in the way that you have i just want to note that uh, there's a couple of people i mean there's so many great people uh that that are already in the room but i wanted to just recognize some of yusuf zai uh, who has spent a lifetime reporting on this conflict? And Sami Bai, I've uh, I've invited you to speak, but I I don't know if uh, a you, you would like to, uh, and b whether you know how to do it. So I'm just going to invite you again, and then you just have to uh, either accept it or you can just request to speak, and I'll accept it. And after we hear from Umar Samad, uh, if if you are able to speak, uh, I'd love to hear from you. We also have uh, uh, Ahmed Walid Kakar, one of the hosts of the Afghan Eye podcast. Fantastic. Uh, we have uh, an old friend of mine, Imran Khan. Uh, Rizwan Saab is here. Uh, there's lots of people that I recognize and I follow uh, keenly. And I'm sure many others who I don't follow, but who have as uh, informed and valuable views as others. Uh, in terms of the format, just so that everyone's clear, we're starting with a little bit of a breakdown by, uh, by Aisha and by Umar. Sami has accepted the invitation to speak. So, Adam, with your permission, after uh, Umar, we'll, we'll ask Sami to share his perspective for a little bit, and then we'll try and bring this to the kind of the U.S. and Pakistan part of the discussion, and we'll we'll uh, we'll start with you on that front, Adam. We'll do this kind of discussion amongst panelists and and other sort of prominent persons that enter the room and are willing to speak, like Sami, and we'll take that to the end of the hour. And then we'll switch over to bringing on uh, anybody and everybody that wants to say anything or contribute or uh, make a statement or, or, or ask a question. Uh, so, Umar Saab, thank you so much for your patience. I don't think you need any kind of uh, formal introduction. Uh, the, the floor is yours, Umar Samad. Thank you. Thank you, Umar Uh I appreciate your invitation to be here today to discuss, as you said, something that is very serious. Serious for Afghanistan, serious for Pakistan, serious for the region, serious for the United States, who's ending 20 years of its presence, military presence in Afghanistan, but continuing in other ways. Um, and let me get back to um, your original question about what has happened in Badakhshan today. 
uh, it is very unfortunate, again, uh, to see our civilians, our people, our young. I saw the pictures of two of the young men who were uh, killed today in Badakhshan because they were asking and protesting uh, for not having access to drinking water and for electricity. So something very um, normal in a normal society. But unfortunately, this is a symptom of uh, in a microcosm of what is wrong with Afghanistan and how we need to fix it. So we can spend a lot of time, uh, and I appreciate uh, Aisha as a young Afghan a woman expressing her views, someone who was born and raised during this period of time and benefited from the past 20 years, what, what, whatever was positive about the past 20 years. For someone like me, I also very clearly remember the previous 20 years and how we got into this situation all the way back to 1973, 78. In 78, I was 17 years old and my, my high school happened to be next to the presidential palace. So I witnessed the communist coup and, and then witnessed what it did to Afghanistan. Since then, we've gone through different uh, phases of instability. Uh, unfortunately, and the Afghan people, and I want to stress on the Afghan people, I'm not talking about the elites that I belong to. Uh, I do not want to talk about the bubbles that have been created that represent a small portion of Afghanistan, but I'm talking about the millions of Afghans who are suffering, like the young men who were killed today because uh the forces, the government security forces decided to shoot on protesters. This should not happen. But at the same time, we are fighting going on in more than 20 provinces as we speak. We have about 20 districts that have fallen to Taliban hands in the past three to four weeks. We have more than 500 uh, security personnel who have been, either been killed or uh, injured in the past 72 hours. Uh, and we have this you know, we have a, a, a momentum shifting toward more fighting, which is what we should not be doing at this stage. We should be shifting toward less fighting, less violence. Where Whoever is responsible, we can discuss that. Uh, obviously, there's not one hand, it's not two hands. It may be multiple hands involved in Afghanistan, as always been the case. Um, and we need to shift toward a focus on a political settlement, uh, as hard as it may be, it is the only option, in my view, that can save the Afghan people from more uh, mayhem down the road. So the focus at this point, with the window still open, when U.S. and NATO troops are in process of leaving and maybe leaving totally within a few weeks, um, and Afghan forces, on one hand, we claim that they are strong enough to defend the republic and to defend the population that is under their control. And on the other hand, we see that there is fragility. Um, and the political elite that is still scrambling to find its voice, which is a very unfortunate issue, this political elite that has benefited over the past 20 years uh, is fractured, unfortunately. Uh, we don't know exactly what is going on with the Taliban. On the Taliban side, they seem to be united. They seem to have one voice, but I, I suspect that that is not totally the case, that there are different voices within the Taliban. There are extreme voices and there are moderate voices. And then obviously there are linkages outside of Afghanistan. Uh, they're, they're, they have support systems in Pakistan. They have uh, now diplomatic relations of sorts. Um, with different countries in the region, from China to Russia to Iran. There's even talk of maybe uh, the, the beginnings of dialogue between India and the Taliban, which in my view is good if, if it leads to something positive for everyone. Uh, so if you look at the big picture, there's a lot going on. There are many balls in the air. There's a lot of bad things happening, but we need to shift towards something more constructive, more positive. And uh, as I said, 
The only way to do that is to shift attention from war, which really has no winners. Uh, yes, maybe on the road somebody can say, I won, but that uh, is not going to be a win that will be celebrated. So we need to really have a win that both the Afghan people can own uh, and control, and also that the region can feel comfortable with. Our neighbors can also feel comfortable with, and that it does not also pose a threat to international security, as we saw before 9-11, and that there are no terrorism, uh, international terrorist threats emanating from Afghanistan. So, uh, so it, it will require a lot of work on the part, on the part of diplomats and political uh, groupings um, uh, to make sure that we uh, shift from the military track to the political track. I will stop here and then obviously we can go on with the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Omar Saab. I think uh, just a couple of things. One, uh, you know, incredibly on brand in terms of focusing on the constructive and, and what is required um, in the future. Uh, I'll also just ask everyone else to mute while, while I'm speaking. Sami Bhai, I'm coming to you next. Uh, just very quickly to say that I, I think you're right, but I also think that there's a lot of folks that that hear the the, the measured way in which uh, you're treating the issue, Umar. And I, I know that there's many Afghan friends who, who feel a sense of trepidation and anger uh, that makes it difficult to be as measured. So with that, uh, Sami Yusufzai, uh, just give us uh, a quick taste of uh, what you see happening and, and what you're hearing and how positive or optimistic you are about where this is heading. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. I'm sorry being a random guest. Uh, I just joined to listen and you are so kind. Uh, honestly, uh, I was never such a disappointed or... Um, I mean, I lost hope about the peace process. Um, uh, uh, from day one, I was covering the rest of the uh, negotiation. And uh, I think uh, there was really great uh, efforts uh, by all uh, parties uh, when there was a uh, uh, American and Taliban negotiation in Doha. And, and at the end of the day, they were able to strike a deal between American and uh, Taliban, uh, but sadly, all those uh, uh, stakeholders who are involved in peace process or speed up the peace process or released brother to join and jump uh, the peace talks. Uh, I think uh, uh, the real peace pe peace was uh, uh, and should be peace between Afghans. I mean, American was outsider. They came and they spent twenty years in Afghanistan. Eventually. One day, uh, 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 they were going to say goodbye to Afghanistan. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, 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 the problem is uh, in the last uh, uh, 12 years since uh, the international community allowed and gave a concession to Taliban to, be, uh, to convert them to a political uh, team or political party, uh, they enjoyed a lot of uh, freedom uh, despite being a part of the United Nations sanction list uh, in Doha. They grew up, they went to every uh, important capital from Tehran to Moscow to Germany. Uh, but honestly, uh, I couldn't find really the Taliban has been changed. And I couldn't find really interest of the Taliban in a political process. Uh, they are uh, uh, they are very still very mute and uh, they are very unclear. Uh, uh, a dozen of time I ask from brother up to uh, this the low level commanders and sub level commanders and ex minister, can you explain to me what would be the uh, woman look like in your next setup? Either the military takeover of the Taliban or or the a coalition government or um, interim government, uh, they never respond. And I remember once one Taliban top leader told me in an interview that, okay, no more burqa if we come back. And after 30 minutes, he was calling and knocking my door in a hotel in Moscow and telling me, would you please don't broadcast this because I will get fired if my leaders know that I said no more burqa for Afghan women. 
so uh, so i don't see really really much uh, uh, interest uh, of the taliban in peace negotiation they believe and sadly they don't care they don't care of the uh, implication they don't care of the consequences and they don't care about whether they want to take our kabul today next year or after 10 years uh, they are happy their leadership is sitting in doha and uh, some of them sitting in pakistan uh, 400 five or seven districts in entire afghanistan uh, so it does not really matter for afghan government to protect uh, these uh, uh, districts uh, with no revenue to the government uh, so i don't see really uh, any constructive uh, dialogue for peace and yes uh, afghan government delegation is sitting in doha and taliban is sitting there taliban try to Uh, pretend that looks we are sitting here for peace talk and afghan government also want to show that okay we are not also running away from the negotiation table uh, but i believe uh, i believe as much i understand i think if uh, international community especially uh, american understand that uh, the taliban is now honest uh, so i think they will be in position to take uh, uh, resignation of the president ashraf ghani for the sake of peace and stability in afghanistan and he wouldn't mind uh, Uh, but uh, american is also disappointed i don't think so they are really uh, believe that the taliban will be ever part of political process i was watching uh, khalid zad interview yesterday that was also really disappointed and he doesn't have any thing new and he was saying okay either there will be peace or long war in afghanistan so i think everyone can comment like that uh, other than i mean uh, uh, he was very uh, very I, I would say, I mean, he's very respect the Taliban. He never speak uh, in a in a in a strong language with the Taliban. That is one of the reason. Uh, maybe he's a very good diplomat, but uh, he should understand that uh, how to speak uh, with the people like Taliban. Uh, so I think uh, 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 both sides and the Afghan government is also preparing uh, to counter the Taliban, uh, uh, and Taliban is just waiting for the withdrawal timetable. Uh, I mean. Uh, they might not really go after the provinces, but uh, will put a lot of pressure in districts. Uh, another sad uh, in- incident, as uh, 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 we were talking about an incident in, today in Badashan, there was a really, really terrible incident uh, two days back uh, in Takhar province next to Badashan. Uh, there is a local non-Pashtun ethnic uh, uh, warlords. He was attacked by, by Taliban. and i'm i'm from that region and i would say uh, the taliban are 50% and 50% of taliban are pashtun 50% of them are non pashtun uh, so the commander pate khan lost uh, his nine people in an ambush of the taliban and what he did uh, he went to near of the pashtun in uh, in the bangi district and kidnapped uh, uh, 30 pashtuns and killed nine of them is a collective punishment So these kinds of incidents are really making uh, the thing worse uh, for everyone. Uh, so uh, the government is under pressure. They could not provide uh, electricity every day. Uh, some elements trying to show the government is totally failure, fail and helpless and hopeless. And uh, next day, uh, some other uh, incidents is happening. So I think there is a collective uh, punishment uh, uh, by Taliban, uh, although they don't claim. lot of incidents but eventually i mean the put is the government is getting under pressure by all side and i think with the pakistan i take uh, action against uh, afghan taliban but i think when he came back home and study the situation in the uh, consultation with the other stakeholder deeply involved in afghanistan go and afghanistan uh, issues i think uh, uh, he is not any more uh, uh, insisting on that promise what he promised to ashraf ghani in kabul and they might be uh, uh, have a reason because the taliban is now a, a reality and they are very strong and pakistan believe if they do something against the afghan taliban so the taliban is now in a blackmailing position of the pakistan they could create trouble for pakistan and religion elements in pakistan could uh, resist against the afghan government the taliban could support uh, ttp in even baloch inside afghanistan because they got a lot of territorial control and right now 95% of the ttp in afghanistan they are hiding in taliban territorial control so this kind of thing is now very complicated for pakistan as well i mean even if they want to really offer some uh, 
uh, good uh, advice or uh, uh, they want to make some efforts but now uh, they are in a very difficult position really to offer something so this is my i mean i'm sorry i randomly joined and i was not really much aware but this is my thought uh, and uh, no, i wish i could I, be really uh, optimistic about the peace in afghanistan no i i i didn't expect uh, anything except realism and and uh, and cogency and coherence uh, some of i thank you for that i think it's really valuable as kind of a uh, a reality check and and i'm appreciative and i hope you'll stay on i'll just ask you to mute your mic when when you're not speaking as as i requested earlier uh adam thank you for being so patient i i just thought with some being in the room it's really important to bring him in i should also quickly just recognize uh, as i have earlier but but i think very important to recognize idris zaman who's the former uh, foreign minister of afghanistan uh and he would have loved to speak but he's actually in a in a location where he can listen and he's listening keenly which i'm which i'm grateful for and many other uh, dear friends including uh the bad labs uh, uh podcast guru Ozaid Yunus who's the host of uh, Pakistanomy is here and and I have colleagues from from the Bad Lab and and other dear friends that are part of the room Adam you've heard Umar you've heard Aisha you've heard Sami Sab what how does all of this land and in particular I think what Sami painted as the complexity now that Pakistan faces maybe you can talk a little bit about the complexity from the US side and then set us up for the for the rest of the discussion uh we know what the sit rep is now where do we go from here adam yeah thanks for having me and um you know i i think it's appropriate i i go last not just due to the status uh stature of the other speakers but uh, i think it um is appropriate because regional voices should go first uh when we're talking about regional topics but um i'm going to speak from an american perspective and um i served as us marine in afghanistan i i volunteered for the marine corps i volunteered for the deployment to afghanistan and i i served in aruzgan province um that being said i i think it's important to recognize that you know i have the privilege of of being in new york city and ultimately what happens in afghanistan and pakistan affects a lot of people on this uh chat far more than it does me and i i recognize that privilege and i think it's important to say that because i'm going to be try to be as real as possible which could come across as insensitive um so that's why i'm i'm saying that up front because i think too many americans sort of beat around the bush when we talk about afghanistan so i'm going to try to say what i what i what i think is really happening from the us perspective and if at times it it it, uh, it appears insensitive how blunt i'm being i i'm sorry for that in advance i think there's five dynamics um from the US perspective that affect you know the future of the Afghan government and Pakistan um leaving the Taliban aside for a moment um the first the first reality is that Afghans have been through horrible a horrible 40 years with their 43 years with immeasurable suffering um and that's something we should all recognize but from the US perspective and from from the global perspective so have a lot of other countries you look at the democratic republic of the congo you know sometimes in a matter of of a couple months in that conflict 1300 civilians get killed and th- throughout that conflict the death toll is in the millions um and many of these countries get noticed even less than afghanistan with even greater atrocities and of course it's not a competition for suffering but i say all of that to say this strategic comms or strat comms that focus on guilt, morality, victimhood, duty, US promises will always fail. From the Afghan perspective, they will always fail. The the US the promise of the US government or promises in international relations are are almost next to meaningless. They they that's US strat comms. When the US talks about a special relationships or promises or its duty to the Afghan people, it's in a self-serving way. it's not because those promises or duties actually exist it's because the, it, it's it, it's a way the united states can sell some other mission it's attempting to do at the time in a way that sounds good either to a domestic us audience or to a foreign audience that it has to sell that mission to so it's it's frankly not productive to talk about us promises to afghanistan there are no us promises to afghanistan i think there's things that the us owes afghanistan whether that actually happens who knows the second dynamic which is unfortunate but shapes the us perspective is that 
the educated Afghan diaspora in the West and the United States, many of those individuals do not believe in Afghanistan as it exists today. Or they believe in it, but they're not themselves willing to live in it, or perhaps even we see that the children of some Afghan elites are living in the West. And this shapes the way Americans view Afghanistan. If the Afghan di diaspora or the elites themselves don't believe in Jaroa, you know, in some sense, it's unrealistic to expect foreigners to. So that's a dynamic I don't think is the most important one, but I think it's one that doesn't get acknowledged, but exists in the back of the minds of, of foreigners who are looking at Afghanistan. A third dynamic, Afghanistan is a small country and it doesn't have a lot of economic potential. I think it has economic potential compared to where it's at now, but there is a ceiling to that potential. Now, the regional strategic importance of Afghanistan is higher than a lot of folks in Washington, D.C., I think, appreciate. I'm not one of those people that thinks, well, we withdraw from Afghanistan and it's just an irrelevant country. I don't think so. I think Afghanistan's important, but I don't think it's as important as some folks in, in Kabul think it is. And certainly because perception is reality in international relations a lot of the time, it's not as important to the average uh, decision maker in the U.S. government as folks in Kabul might want it to be. Another dynamic, the clock is now ticking on U.S. assistance. And some Afghan elites in government are already making the same mistakes that helped tip the scale in favor of withdrawal. You know, that, that withdrawal decision was a decision, a decision that the Biden administration made because it felt it was in the U.S. interest. But there were actions that the Afghan government took, and there were public messages that the Afghan government put out, and there were statements made by Afghan officials that helped push the Biden administration ultimately towards a withdrawal decision. You know, there is an element of it being a self-inflicted wound, even though I think the main driver of the decision was ultimately what the Biden administration calculated was in U.S. interests. Those same mistakes, though, are now threatening future U.S. aid. I don't think the threat is imminent. I think the United States will, will continue funding the Afghan government and ANDSF and civil society in the near future. But I don't think that that, um, that aid is necessarily something that's promised. And even though I think it would be a mistake to cut it off or reduce it significantly, I don't think that's something that the Afghan government can just take for granted. And then, you know, lastly, I'd say, and this is something that I know, you know, is going to possibly um, upset folks. To some extent, Afghanistan is always going to exist in, in the shadow of Pakistan. And that's simply because Pakistan is a much larger country, a, 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 a country with much more resources. It's a nuclear power. And, and this is just a dynamic that all smaller landlocked states in the world have to deal with, or at least most of them. They live in the shadow of a larger state. That's just a fact. It's never going to be different. Um, and whether this is fair or not fair, the burden will always be on the Afghan government to find a way to make that unfortunate dynamic work. And I, a couple weeks ago, I criticized some statements of, of Mr. Mohib, um, and some folks got upset about it. And, you know, I... They, they thought it might be, you know, the, the equivalent of being an apologist for some of Pakistan's bad actions. Sure, Pakistan has committed many bad actions inside Afghanistan, and so has the U.S. for that matter. But, but Mohib's job, in my view, the role of, 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 of an NSA is not to be somebody who, who makes the mic drop and who acts as a truth commission. The role is to protect Afghan people. And you don't do that by alienating probably the most consequential country to the future of Afghanistan. And, and frankly, alienating U.S. officials as well by, by making statement after statement that is, is, is so provocative that it makes progress towards any kind of settlement difficult. So, um, and, the, and the last part, which I think is the most important part, because I've seen a recent push by, you know, Afghan civil society and Afghan officials that perhaps the United States should label Pakistan a state sponsor of terrorism or do this and that. The United States will never turn Pakistan into a pariah state for the future of Afghanistan. That's a fundamental miscalculation of U.S. interests. Pakistan is exponentially more important to the United States than Afghanistan is. That may be a reality folks don't like, but that's just the way it is. Now, sometimes Pakistanis will hear quotes like that and they'll think, see, we're, we're more important. It's not necessarily true that Pakistan is more important for the right reasons. Many of those reasons are bad reasons. Many of those reasons have to do with U.S. concerns over nuclear security in South Asia, U.S. concerns over counterterrorism.
But the fact is that the United States will not turn Pakistan into a pariah state solely for the future of Afghanistan. And frankly, if you look at the um, maximum pressure campaign against Iran, I highly doubt that even if the United States were willing to do that to Pakistan, that it would actually produce positive results. I think it might produce negative results. But that can be debated. It's not going to happen anyway. So then where are we left? We're left in a situation where how can the United States and Pakistan um, and Afghanistan work together to form some so type of settlement that makes the, the country more peaceful for Afghans and preserves uh, some of the rights that have been gained over the last 20 years. But one of the problems with that is we have a different set or a different order of preferences. I think it's true that the United States, Pakistan, Russia, China, India, and Afghanistan, and maybe even the Taliban would rather have a stable Afghanistan than, than, than one that's completely in chaos and civil war. But that might be their ideal choice. But what these countries are willing to accept as their second choice, that's where the difference is. I mean, the United States would be perfectly happy to have a stable Afghan government that's closely aligned with India and, uh, you know, doesn't have a civil war if that was possible. I don't think Pakistan would be, um, would be content with that. And so we have a misalignment when it comes to the order of preferences. So some might argue that there are there are parts of the Pakistani government that would prefer to see a chaotic Afghanistan than one that's stable but closely aligned with India. And they have their reasons for that. We can debate whether those reasons are valid, but that's, I think, a, a, a way they, they view it. Um, so given all of these dynamics, we're kind of navigating a web of different interests and in how can we work towards a political settlement? And that's the point of this, this discussion, I think. And I'm, I'm happy to go into more details about what I think could work, but I'll leave it at that for now. I really appreciate that, Adam. I just, maybe I start with a little bit of pushback on, on, on something you said. I mean, you referenced Hamdullah Mo, Mohib's recent sort of, I don't know if statements is the right word, but... Let me offer uh, maybe uh, an unexpected reaction to that fr from the Pakistani perspective. And obviously, I don't speak for Pakistan, but I am a Pakistani. Um, and, and I have no affiliation or, or relationship with the government. So I say this as an independent Pakistani to the extent anyone can be in this day and age. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, paying that much attention to what uh, Alhamdulillah John has to say uh, is really A, in Pakistan's interests, and B, behooving of the Pakistani state. I think that whenever Pakistan reacts to any kind of uh, outrage uh, by, by an official in, in the Afghan uh, Republic, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, that by reacting, any reaction is an overreaction. So, for example, I've read that one of the reasons that there's been a delay in some statements that Pakistan was going to make uh, that were going to be uh, positive and proactive in favor of the republic, uh, and also there was going to be a phone call between Prime Minister Khan and President Ghani, that those things have been postponed or pushed off because of the the so-called bad behavior, whether it's Ashraf Ghani leaking you know, to Der Spiegel, uh, as, as if the president of a sovereign country is somehow bound um, in his or her, you know, sort of uh, interactions with the press. And I think more importantly, the, you know, reacting to Alhamdulillah. I, I, I just don't see the, the value in that. And actually, I don't see how Pakistani interests are, are served by that. We had a similar shortness uh, in Washington during the Trump administration when Alhamdulillah was persona non grata or declared persona non grata. There is an element of Afghan civil society, of Afghan citizenry that actually requires an expression of this rage because because that's what they're experiencing they're experiencing a lot of death and torment and no certainty whatsoever about what the future might hold uh, so maybe adam just quickly respond to why wouldn't some afghans choose the most wild and maybe inappropriate to me as a Pakistani, but perfectly legitimate and appropriate to somebody who's living in Afghanistan and who has friends that have been blown up and is watching the news and there's new tickers on Tolo News every night about another journalist being killed. How do we square those two, those two things? Well, look, I agree with you that it wasn't positive for Pakistan to cease communications, but what I'm really saying is that the, the price that Pakistan will pay is smaller than the price that Afghanistan will pay. And so Afghan leaders have to 
accept that reality when they make decisions. It's not a fair reality. It, it's just the power dynamic that exists. And what I would say to, to someone like Mr. Mohib about why he shouldn't engage in that kind of vitriol um, is because it's not him who's going to pay the price. And perhaps he has political ambitions, as some folks say, but it's not him who's going to pay the immediate price. It's uh, it's it's, it's day-to-day Afghans um, who are going to pay the price of a breakdown in those relations. And Look, if I could change the way Pakistan views, um, you know, Afghanistan and, and, and views the relationship of Afghanistan to its tensions with India and the way it views the Taliban, if I could wave a magic wand and do that, sure, I would. And do I think it's I, I don't think Pakistan engages in, in, in actions that are necessarily rational. And I, I think it has, um, you know, uh, I think it downplays threats that do exist and overplays threats that might not exist. Um but, but, you know, this gets back to my original point, which is that the burden of managing this relationship, unfortunately, will fall on Afghan officials. Nobody said that's fair. It's not fair. But it's just the way it is. Because the reality is that the price that will be paid by a breakdown in relations, it won't be zero for Pakistan. I mean, I think Pakistan in unstable Afghanistan is going to have huge sec- security ramifications for, for Pakistan. And I think... You already see TTP violence uh, um, going up, and I think Pakistan is at a risk of, you know, if it if it doesn't change its course, I think it's at a risk of seeing the kind of violence that perhaps we saw a decade ago. But in the short term, the immediate consequences will be far greater for um, for Afghanistan. And the other issue at play is these these um, exchanges between Pakistan and Af- Afghanistan don't happen in a vacuum. They also shape who the United States thinks is a reliable partner. And as I said, Pakistan is more important to Washington than Afghanistan. So given that dynamic, Afghan officials have to make a a calculation. And maybe the calculation is that venting and saying what Afghans feel and their truth, maybe that's worth it. I question whether it's worth it for an NSA to do that. Well, let's go to, let's go to, we'll go to Umar uh, Samad and then, and then we'll go to Aisha on this question. Before we do, Umar, I just quickly want to recognize uh, the great Iqbal Thiba is in the room. Um, uh, Professor Dr. Adil Najam is in the room. Uh, Amnesty, uh, sorry, um, uh, another friend, uh, Umar Varaj is, uh, is in the room. Uh, and I also see Bilal Lakani, Sakhavat Saab, and Hassan uh, Akbar, uh, Fawzia Yazdani, and um, again, the uh, one of the hosts of the Afghani podcast, Sangar Pekhar, is here as well. I, I point out all of you because over the next few minutes, we're going to try and shift from uh, the panel to sort of opening it up and, and bringing some of you on. Any of you that are willing to speak or contribute, please please do sort of raise your hand and, and request to speak. Now, Omar, Adam said a bunch of things that at some level have to be hard for an Afghan to hear. But rather than focusing on that or, or getting distracted with the whole sort of the trolling aspect of, you know, what some leaders have to do in Kabul, what is it that, that Afghan leaders can do in the situation that they're in? And in a sense, the more important part of the conversation and the, and the, and the topic, which is what is it that Pakistan or the U.S. could do to mobilize and coalesce a number of Afghan leaders, Taliban or not Taliban, around an agenda for peace that that helps push this forward because as you said and i think as aisha and and, and sami also sami in particular uh summarized there's there's a real kind of paralysis at, at the moment how do we how do we help afghan leaders out of this uh, being stuck in the mud right well now? that should be the objective right uh we're not here to discuss the last 40 years and uh, you know we can do that uh, on the side and spend days and weeks the focus should be, as I said initially, on understanding where we are right now, at which juncture we stand, what are the, the worst options, the best options, the bad option versus anything else that exists. And I have to say the window is closing in some ways, but they, we need to see how we can open other windows um, in order to get Afghanistan out of the mess that it's in. Because I do agree, uh, uh, with Adam in, in, in some ways uh, about his assessment as as an Afghan, uh, you know, we have to be realistic. We have to take responsibility for what we say, what we do. Uh, sometimes we are 
emotional about issues. And, you know, there's 43 years of war that uh, adds to the emotions that Afghans have. Sometimes it's bravado and sometimes uh, it's just misplaced. But also, I have to tell you, when Mr. Mohib in Washington made the statements about three years ago, it wasn't in a vacuum. It was very calculated. And it sent a message to several different uh, constituencies as to what to expect from here on. And then this statement also, to my, to, in my view, um, it, it's, it's, it's untimely, it's, it's inappropriate in some ways, but also reflects the emotions of some Afghans, definitely. But at the same time, there's more to it. Uh, so the question comes up, is this all? There's, there's mu there must be much more calculations behind it. Mr. Rani is reported to have flown secretly to Pakistan and met General Bajwa for many hours during Ramadan. There have been secret talks in Kabul. There have been all kinds of different contacts. The British have been involved. The Americans want to push a certain agenda and see if it works. So there is a lot going on. And at the same time, you see the loss of so much territory. You see things shifting on the ground. And so Afghans uh, are very suspicious minded nowadays, and they try to look beyond just the surface and see if they can see what's really happening. So I will leave it at that. But coming back to what Adam said earlier, I want to focus in your question, uh, Mushahid, I want to focus on two words, miscalculation and misalignment of preferences. You see, if you go back as an Afghan, if I go back uh, into the past 43 years, and if I go back to what is happening today, and I look at today, I see miscalculations. I see short-term expediency. I, I see no strategy, actually, on the Afghan part. I see the Taliban have a strategy, but, you know, and they seem to be heading toward their goals. Um, and I also see a lot of misalignment uh, on the Afghan side. And, and I wonder sometimes, when are we going to learn? Because we have a template that is full of lessons, lessons that have to be learned. And if we do not learn those lessons, uh, we may end up in a worse, worsening situation, which is not what uh, will help us or the region or the world. Uh, there may be some uh, quarters who think that continued instability in Afghanistan, continued warfare in Afghanistan, continued mayhem in Afghanistan serves their interests. But, you know, that is, again, short-term and expedient because it's, a, it's better if we have a, a, a stable Afghanistan. It's better if we have an Afghanistan whose resources and riches and minerals can be exploited by all well-meaning countries and companies and corporations. We need, we need an Afghanistan that is connecting to the to South Asia and, and, and Central Asia and the Middle East and China and and even to the Belt and Road uh, 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 initiative and everything that comes with that in Afghanistan that uh, can be a hub for trade and transit and so on and so forth. We need to uh, have a vision of that kind of an Afghanistan in an Afghanistan that is no longer, as I said earlier, a threat. So. Here is a point we can share. Where do we have commonality between the U.S., Pakistan, and Afghanistan in this case, which could also involve China, maybe Russia, Central Asia, maybe even at some point the Iranians. Uh, it, we need to find areas of commonality. We need to put away areas that divide us and make it more difficult to uh, resolve this problem, this longstanding problem. Uh, and I think that we are at the cracks here right now because the U.S. is going to leave. You know, I've been warning for several years that this might happen, but very irresponsible people in Kabul are not listening because they're only looking at their very narrow interests and 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 their and their and the advantages and the benefits that they have derived from the last few years. And those who cheer them, whether in Washington or somewhere else. Uh, not realizing, you know, that uh, we need to, first of all, solve the problems inside Afghanistan. We need to have an Afghan settlement.
because we have a part of our society that is fighting the rest of the society. And, and this has to stop. And so we need to sit down as uh, citizens of this country. Yes, there are different viewpoints, ideologically different, but we're not that different from other countries. We don't need to resolve our issues by killing each other. You know, we've been trying to impose uh, uh, social engineering and political engineering on Afghanistan for a very long time. It does not work. There is always a backlash. We need to involve and empower our own citizenry, and, and we need to come up with a system that works for the majority, whether that is sort of a democratic system, whether that is a semi-democratic traditional system, whether it's something that uh, sort of uh, uh, realigns social and political structures in Afghanistan. We, we, can, we can do that through negotiations and compromise. And, 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 and part of it could be more Islamic, part of it could be less Islamic, or we come up with a system that is acceptable to the majority. That is very important. Uh, but if we close all those doors at this point, if we shut all those windows, if we talk about doomsday scenarios, and we complain constantly, and we blame each other, and we use spoilers, or you, spoilers use us to prevent us from finding that space, that Afghan space, that shared space, then we're not going to get out of this. And I think the role of the, 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 the region is very important. Countries such as Pakistan, yes, Pakistan has had a problem with Afghanistan. Afghanistan has had a problem with Pakistan for many years. Uh, we, we hope and we think that we may be in a different space right now, that there has been some kind of paradigm shift, that Pakistan needs stability in Afghanistan, whereas Pakistan before needed instability. We have to admit to that too. But hopefully they don't need instability anymore. That India and Pakistan, whose relationship is very critical to what is happening in Afghanistan, can come to terms on some issues that have to do with Afghanistan. Uh, and it could be a win-win situation. I know that things are very different in, on that side. Uh, the countries like China and Russia and, and Iran even uh, uh, can, can uh, also find ground for some kind of an arrangement that works for everyone. You know, I'm reminded of Afghanistan before 1978. It wasn't perfect, but it was stable. It was peaceful. It had relations with the rest of the world. It balanced things out. So we need a new balance. And this new balancing act requires vision, strategy, leadership which we are lacking, unfortunately. And we need to, uh, you know, others need to help us and so that we can help ourselves find that kind of leadership. Uh, thanks, Omar. I think, again, very, as always, uh, super sort of clear. Um, but it does leave a question that I, that I think I'd like to take to Aisha. Uh, maybe, Aisha, you can address this. You know, the... the the identification of a gap in leadership, and, and again, not as a criticism of Afghan leaders, uh, but this gap in leadership, I think, in part is also informed by the disconnect between uh, young Afghans like yourself and people in positions of power, and certainly people in positions of power as far as the Taliban are concerned. Uh, how do you see, uh, A, do you, do you think that's right? Do, do you think that there's a lack of connection, connectivity, responsiveness to young Afghans in terms of what their issues are and what they want, either from the Republic or the Emirate? And then how do you, how do you see a solution to that? Because surely one of the ways in which Afghan leaders can have more uh, say as, it, as far as the behavior of a country like Pakistan or a country like the U.S. is concerned is if they have the, the, for, the full force of the Afghan people behind them. And I'm not sure that they always have that, uh, that advantage. Aisha? Um, well, before I come to, to this point, um, I want to emphasize the fact that the reason why we have uh, this discussion tonight is because there's a peace process going on. And why do we have peace is because of the fact that a war started uh, 40 years ago in Afghanistan in which uh, United States and Pakistan played a very crucial and important role 
And now that we are about to open a new chapter, uh, we can also see that the United States and, and Pakistan play an important role um, and, and a potentially constructive role in the whole peace building and conflict resolution dynamics, um, which I want to focus on later on um, about the common grounds that that we can focus on um, and and the possible opportunities and, and alternatives and and. and um, and uh, the way ahead that we can we can focus on, but the irony for me, um, uh, as a as someone living and studying here in Afghanistan, is the fact that all parties involved in this national security as well. Um, but what um, um, what I heard from from um, Adam was, but this is real politics. Uh, he was blank about it and and um he mentioned some of the things that i do not agree um but i can right now focus on the things that i believe we can uh find a common ground um and 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 we can we can build upon in order to ensure that this limited opportunity that we still have um and before the point of no return is reached we use that um uh, productively and make sure that the worst of scenario is prevented from happening um so despite all the all the differences of opinions that we have despite the the fact that um the peace process is still not inclusive it's not actually a peace process yet because we have the peace negotiations formal negotiations in doha uh, which which uh made it very clear to to the afghan people and and um and everyone involved in this process that peace cannot trickle down from a uh, mere agreement between the negotiating parties. And we really need um, a comprehensive ceasefire first as a precondition in order to make sure that the peace process on the ground, the process of reconciliation and, and reintegration and healing um, uh, go hand in hand together with the formal negotiations. And for that, I believe that the United States and, and um, especially um, Pakistan can pressure Taliban in order to, to commit to, um, uh, to ceasefire, in order to make that happen. Um, and at this moment in time, um, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Sheriff, that I believe uh, today are aligned. And um, United States and Pakistan, um, I, I think it will be safe to, to conclude that um, United States need um, Pakistan and our, for the stability and peace in Afghanistan. And as far as the Afghans are concerned, uh, we personally see this unconditional withdrawal um, as an irresponsible and rushed decision. And we personally, um, I believe, and, and I'm sure uh, it resonates with a lot of Afghans that uh, Pakistan is not um, actually, um, we're not keeping its end of the bargain uh, by pushing and pressuring Taliban to, to uh, decrease violence or commit to the peace. But still, uh, we have the chance to, to prevent the worst of scenarios from happening because um, in this region, uh, at this moment in time, we are in the same boat. And if one state is about to sink, we will all sink together, if not immediately, but eventually. Because the future of Afghanistan is closely bound, very um, um, uh, concretely, closely bound uh, with, with the rest of the region. And um, what I heard during my lobbying for the inclusive peace we envision for, for uh, this process and eventually for the future of Afghanistan was the lip service I heard from the international community, from the government, from the negotiating parties overall. And, and th that's um, what makes us concerned because we do not want this uh, opportunity to be a missed one uh, once again. And because um, the only solution for the individual challenge that we face as an Afghanistan, as a state, um, um, and, and the collective challenge that we face as a region, um, the only solution to that is a stable Afghanistan. And if the region, if Pakistan and if the United States and, and any other party involved in this process, they are moving towards, uh, not moving actually towards that uh, that end, then we uh, we will be moving in circles and probably missing the only opportunity we have to make sure that we leave a dignified legacy behind. Um, and uh, considering the common grounds, um, I believe that in order to make sure that um, 
through this peace um, process, we we uh, uh, we ensure a stable future for the region. Afghanistan and Pakistan they need to fight uh, religious uh, um, extremism, and and today, um, w- what makes me hopeful about this process is if it's used wisely and and if this opportunity is um, not lost in this um, whole uh, um, uh, process of of uh, pursuing national interest um, of each state that are involved, I believe that openness and cooperation is the best way forward. Um, despite the differences we have, I believe um, that uh, we can we can make sure this. Uh, future cross-border cooperation um, which could be advanced through the CPEC and uh, eco organizations um, would make sure that uh, the future generation not only in Afghanistan but in all across the region will be able to live in peace and stability um, and and um, and for that I, I always envisioned as, as a young person uh, living here and seeing all the uh, the the ten the the tension with neighboring countries and and all the um, conflict uh, it could be forfeited uh, my vision could be forfeited it could be impossible at this moment but I believe uh, this region needs an European Union model um, of cross border cooperation and the post peace process of Afghanistan I believe it would be it would be possible and it would be something that we can really look forward to. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's all I had. Uh, I should, uh, no, thank you for that. I, I think one of the uh, really exciting things about where, where I'm sitting and, and what I get to do is to have uh, friends from, of, from Afghanistan uh, like Omar and, and like Sami Bai and, and like you uh, speak as clearly and, and uh, as cogently and as maturely as you do. Uh, I think it's, a, you know, it's everything is an example of, of uh, you know, the kind of voice that people need to pay more attention to. I think it's too easy for Americans and Pakistanis to pick on Amrullah Saleh or Hamdullah Mohib and, and, uh, and, and use those as uh, demonstrative or representative of, uh, of progressive, urban, uh, educated uh, Afghans who, who have a vision for the future of Afghanistan that is no different than a Californian or a, or, or a Finn or, or somebody Japanese or, or you know, or Pakistani or American. And so uh, I, I, I think the reason I say this is because we're going to uh, we're going to transition into bringing other folks and questions and comments on. I did, again, want to recognize uh, Janan Musazai, former ambassador of Afghanistan to China, uh, as well as to Pakistan, former spokesperson, and most importantly, um, my brother from another mother. And I've invited him to speak, but I also thought I would explicitly state that on the record, that Janan, if you're willing to speak, I'd be very happy to bring you on board. Before we open it up and I start bringing folks on for quick comments and questions, and the rule we'll try to follow is very quick fire questions or comments. You can say whatever you want. As long as you're not impolite or insulting, uh, you'll stay in the room and there is no viewpoint that isn't acceptable as long as it's not offensive. Um, and since it's our room, we'll decide what's <laughs> offensive. Uh, but, but hopefully you'll find us to be incredibly open and willing to hear different points of view. Uh, Adam, you heard Omar and uh, and Aisha. Uh, I'm still kind of processing and absorbing what Sami had to say. Wh- where do we go from here? What is it specifically that the U.S. and Pakistan can do that is that is imaginable uh, as being within the realm of the possible? Before before you speak, Adam, I just wanted to. I, I noticed that Janan has turned on the speaker, so maybe if it's okay with you, uh, Adam, say so, and and uh, we can let uh, Janan uh, sort of share his thoughts and and share his experiences uh, real quick. Yeah, sure. Let's hear from Janan first. Janan said, uh, "Salam alaikum, Musharraf, and uh, salam alaikum to everyone." This is. I must admit that this is my first uh, Twitter Spaces experience. It's. Um, uh, a really interesting uh, one, I must say. Uh, but uh, no, I would actually ask Adam to please go ahead and share your thoughts. Um, I can go after you. 
I, I guess uh, the Farsi word for this would be taraf, at least in the Iranian Farsi. But I'll I'll, I'll accept it and I'll, I'll go quickly. Please, and I think please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just joking about taraf, of course, of course. But um, I, I I guess you know I, I focused in the past about what the limits of of these interactions were, and you know um, you know uh, Ambassador Khalilzad has said in numerous congressional hearings, he he likes to say the statement that women's rights in Afghanistan, for example, comes only second to counterterrorism. And I think that's uh, Mr. Khalilzad's way of saying that he, um, he, he cares about uh, the conditions for Afghans on the ground, and it's not just about CT. Of course, what we have to remember is that that gap between those two priorities is massive. So I think the main concern for the United States going forward in Afghanistan is security, security, security. That being said, the way the U.S. chooses to pursue that um, that 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 concern is going to really impact uh, Afghans and whether there's peace in the region or not. For example, I think it would be a mistake for the United States to simultaneously try to co cooperate uh, with Pakistan on CT in the region, but also back uh, warlords inside Afghanistan. That would be a re repeat of the mistakes of the last 20 years. It would only, in actually the last 40 years for that matter, it would only increase the misalignment. Um, and I think it would have disastrous effects for Afghans on the ground. So I think what needs to happen is that, uh, you know, the, the, the United States needs to make it really clear to Pakistan that you cannot have a normal relationship with the United States if Afghanistan is, is, is burning in a civil war. And I think there's folks in the, Afghan, in the Pakistani government who, who genuinely believe you can compartmentalize these two issues and Afghanistan can be in complete chaos, but, you know, U.S.-Pakistan relations can you know, pursue other objectives. I don't think that's true. So long as Afghanistan is in chaos, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship will be dysfunctional. So I think Pakistanis need to understand that. The decision makers in Pakistan need to understand that. And, you know, in an ideal scenario, a peace, I, you know, I actually, I agree with Aisha, this can't even be called a peace talk. It, it was, you know, it, it, it was an agreement for the United States to leave and not get shot on the way out, essentially. That was the U.S.-Taliban agreement the U.S. to leave and not get shot on the way out, and that some form of talks would begin. So it achieved those limited means, but it, was, it, it has not achieved a true peace process. So, so, so I think, you know, in an ideal scenario, there would be a ceasefire. I don't think that's going to happen from the Taliban. And, and a lot of peace talks in history, you don't get a ceasefire from, from the side that at least thinks it's militarily superior, whether that's objectively true or not, we can debate, but the Taliban have that calculation. But what I do think we could get is a, a serious reduction in violence. I mean a significant reduction in violence or some sort of limited ceasefire. And by limited ceasefire, I don't mean a ceasefire that lasts three days um, around Eid al-Fitr. I mean a ceasefire that's, that's much more expansive than that, but perhaps not complete. I think that's what might be achievable. Of course, ideally, if you could have a full ceasefire, fine. I don't see that happening. But a reduction in violence that's significant, that saves lives, I think the Pakistani establishment does have the ability to, to at least try to get the Taliban to do that. I don't, know, I don't think they control the Taliban, but I think they have the ability to try to get the Taliban to do that. And I think the Taliban need to understand that... <laughs> Uh, things are not going to go their way if they just try to take over provincial capitals. Um, they'll they'll continue to be in a in in a pariah for uh, uh, indefinitely. Do I think the Taliban have changed in terms of their views? No, I don't think the Taliban have changed in terms of their views. But I do think they have a little bit deeper understanding of real politic and perhaps their place in the in the world and how uh, how other countries view them and perhaps the importance of 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 those perspectives. So. I think that's where the U.S. and Pakistan can work together in trying to uh, change um, the Taliban's behavior. Uh, I think Pakistan and the United States can work together on trying to, uh, you know, trade between Afghanistan and Pakistan, ensuring the borders remain open, ensuring when there are refugee flows that they're taken care of. Th there's many ways that the two countries can work together. And then the most important one is to keep the fora alive for negotiations. Um, I think to some extent the Taliban are engaging in negotiations almost for show right now, simply to have a justification to keep their office in Doha open and it be perceived as complying with the U.S.-Taliban agreement. I think they need to 
I think a strong message needs to be delivered by the United States and Pakistan that you have to engage in substantive negotiations. You can't just show up and sit at the table and talk about nothing. Um, and, uh, but I also think that I would, uh, that, that the process should be more inclusive, as Aisha said. I mean, if this is a process that's already struggling, um, why make concessions? Uh, for example, not having many women in the negotiation process. I mean, I don't think that has exactly. produced any results. So, so I would say that it should be a more inclusive process that includes younger people, includes Afghan women, because if the Taliban aren't willing to negotiate with Afghan society, then they're not going to come up with an agreement that is implementable anyway. So you might as well, you know, make the process representative from the beginning. That, that's what I think. Adam, let me just, you know, put on my, my, my Pakistani hat for one second and just make an observation. And then maybe I can ask Amber if, uh, if she's able to, maybe if she has any questions of any of the panelists or, uh, and, and then we'll go to Janan and then we'll open it up for questions. So another three or four minutes before we open up for questions. Real quick, I mean, I don't know if you follow the news on Pakistan. I'm being sarcastic. Of course, I know you follow it intensely. And therefore, you would know, Adam, and, and I hope that our Afghan friends and our Pakistani friends and American friends understand this. Pinning the outcomes of what the situation in Afghanistan is on the Pakistani state is a real stretch, given how much the Pakistani state struggles to control and deliver outcomes within Pakistan forget within Pakistan, within sometimes Islamabad, the capital city itself. So uh, now, uh, of course, there are things Pakistan can do, and I think it's demonstrated that it can do them, and it has done some of them. But but it's not like Pakistan is a, um, how do I say this without sort of, you know, angering anybody or, or, or being uh, contemptuous. But Pakistan does not have the capability to deliver the full range of services that a modern nation state should be delivering to its own people to try and make it or saddle it with the responsibility of some sort of guardianship of the or stewardship of peace and prosperity in Afghanistan. It may be the right thing to ask for. It's definitely something I keep asking the Pakistani state for, and I, and I hope it can deliver, but it seems like it's a bit of a stretch on, on the capacity front. Uh, I don't need you to respond to that, Adam, but of course I'm happy for you if, if you want to come back on that. And then, as I said, if Ambar, if you're able to, uh, or if you'd like to ask any questions, please uh, jump in. And if not, uh, go ahead, Adam. Oh, oh I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, I just have a 20-second response, and I'll keep it really short because I don't want to take too much time. I think it's true that in Washington folks inflate and even in Kabul for that matter folks inflate the amount of control that the Pakistani state has over the Taliban it's inflated no doubt and here's the here's the elephant in the room I think there's probably a lot of decision makers in Washington that don't even want Pakistan to expel the Taliban leadership because nobody knows what that would lead to and in some sense it's better to deal with the devil that you know than the unknown and that's it there has to be a consistent, visible effort. And it, ha it might not be visible to the public, but it needs to be visible to the U.S. decision makers for that relationship to remain functional. Uh, thanks, Adam. So let's hear Janan first, and then Amber, um, maybe you can uh, shoot a few questions at the speakers, and then we'll go to the wider. Through um, the civil society activities that we're engaged in, um, uh, Afghan women leaders are uh, playing their role uh, we have uh, religious scholars who are doing that, youth leaders inside and outside the country. But uh, I agree, Musharraf, with your point about expecting too much uh, from Pakistan or any other external player to come in and uh, bring peace to Afghanistan for us, to fix the war for us. However, uh, there, is, uh, there is another fact which we must acknowledge, which is that uh, Afghanistan's war uh, is not uh, is 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 not uh, a conflict that only has roots and causes internal to Afghanistan. That there are regional and uh, global dimensions, and uh, in the regional context, Pakistan has an outsized role in in the conflict in Afghanistan, and um, uh, it can become, uh, I think, uh, quite um, easily, uh, at least the regional champion. Uh, for the peace process in Afghanistan. Now, where's the problem? Um, uh, I think Pakistan can eminently play that role. 
But the problem is uh, in the inability, in my view, of uh, the governments, uh, the leaders that matter, um, and I say that deliberately because we must always include the military leadership in Pakistan when it comes to Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship, have not been able, I should not say that they have failed, but they have not been able yet to um, to define an agenda of uh, building trust and building positive, constructive cooperation that would um, nudge them uh, you know, towards a, um, a, a different paradigm, both in the bilateral relationship, but also in terms of the uh, the position and the uh, the stance of other regional countries, next door neighbors of Afghanistan and extended neighbors, when it comes to uh, support for the peace process, because for as long as there is a perception and that perception exists, it's prevalent throughout the region and internationally, as Adam was um, uh, was alluding to, that uh, Pakistan has not uh, fundamentally. Uh, changed its strategy of being a party to the current war in Afghanistan. In other words, it has not shifted away from a policy of uh, supporting the Taliban by hosting them, by providing them advice, perhaps uh, resources. And, um, and listen, until that happens, uh, it would be very difficult to expect many other countries in the region to fully uh, rally behind a regional consensus and support and guarantee mechanism for peace in Afghanistan. I do believe that um, uh, and, and acknowledge the fact that there has been a positive shift in Pakistan, at least in terms of rhetoric, uh, uh, although it's not, it's nothing new. I mean, the whole um, uh, emphasis by both Prime Minister and 15 I heard this almost every day from government officials and also from people outside the government, in parliament, in the media, elsewhere. But what we need is first, uh, first and foremost, in my view, for Afghanistan and Pakistan to define an agenda that is specific, that's action-based, where you can measure progress towards a new relationship, a new paradigm uh, at the bilateral level. And which you can then expand to the regional level. And unfortunately, we haven't seen that. Uh, Prime Minister Ibrahim Khan was in Kabul, for example, in November of last year. The two uh, sides agreed on a very detailed, time-bound <laughs> list of actions that they would take uh, in terms of uh, trade, in terms of Pakistan's support of the peace process. I don't think that any of those actions that were mutually agreed by Prime Minister Imran Khan and President uh, Ashraf Ghani have actually been implemented, and that was November of 2020. And we are uh, to lead, uh, as it were, uh, on the peace process in Afghanistan. Uh, it can uh, provide a supportive role. It can um, rally uh, its NATO partners and allies in support to the peace process in Afghanistan. It can provide uh, financial support. It can provide political backing. It can provide support through the UN Security Council, its presence there. But the peace process in Afghanistan has to be Afghan-led, Afghan-owned, and it has to be led and owned and embraced by the region. Uh, we, we must not forget that. And that's where I think Pakistan can truly play a leading role uh, with Afghanistan, but also with uh, our other neighbors and uh, key countries in the region. Uh, Janan, before before uh, before uh, Amber, uh, you know, shares uh, a couple of questions uh, for, for for speakers, including yourself, just to lean into this question of you know, you mentioned the agreement from November 2020 um, and the lack of progress, uh, but Janan, you'll also remember an agreement between Finance Minister Isaac Dad and Finance Minister at that time Omar Zakhilwal in. Uh, in November of two, uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken, that had 42 action points. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and as we lamented uh, many times during your tour of duty here, as well as for many months and years after, um, a lot of those points were never addressed. And indeed, we had the Afghan Transit Trade Agreement 
um, essentially expire. And now it's been, you know, extended for a few uh, for a few months. And my frustration, you know, in terms of decision making here in Pakistan is that those kinds of agreements. I mean, it's very much like the Nadra PO, POR card, mm. uh, you know, it, just rolling it over, rolling it over, rolling it over. And the, the problem there is that there's no new policy energy within Pakistan that's being dedicated to this problematic relationship. As a Pakistani, uh, as, as friends will understand, we have lots and lots of complaints uh, from our Afghan brothers and sisters, especially the Afghan elite. Uh, and we have complaints with the Taliban too. But this isn't the that forum. I'm so grateful that, that you spoke, Janan. I hope you'll stick around. Um, but did you want to shoot a few questions at uh, at Aisha or Umar or, or Sami or, or Janan or Adam? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Musharraf. And and this has been such an such an incredible sort of discussion. Question that I would have for Aisha is because I see in Pakistan and the Pakistani media where any discussion about the Afghan peace process is really centered on official level contacts, meetings. Um, foreign ministers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I see that is is missing is a recognition, or at least a coverage in the Pakistani press, or uh, of of the impact of this peace process, or the lack of it, or the failure of it, or the potential for for uh, escalation, more escalation and violence that could spill over into Pakistan, and its impact on Pakistan, or a sympathy for. Um, the Afghan civil society, um, young people and women. So Aisha, how do you think, for instance, how would you like a Pakistani civil society to engage? Let's start with Aisha and then we'll go back to the first question on, on, the, on, the, on the gloominess of the assessment. And we'll go to Umar for that one and then Adam. Aisha? Um, thank you, Amber, for your question. Well, um, regarding the elite-oriented peace negotiations that we have right now, um, I mentioned several times that this process can never be improved. Uh, Pakistan civil society um, can engage. Um, I, I really believe that we, we have a shared region and our region contains as many solutions as it has problems. So um, cross-border cooperation and, and having, uh, having sort of dialogue that can bring people of two nations together, bring people of the region together, uh, because we are a community. Thank you. Uh, Omar, uh, maybe Amber's first question? Yes. Yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, failure uh, and gloominess, as you call it, uh, I think it's very pejorative and subjective in some ways. Um, but... Um, it, it, you know, it, it depends on who you are, and and uh, we, we need to ask um, failure for whom, success for whom. But at the end of the day, uh, we need to ask um, who does it serve? What Afghanistan failure? Whose in, intentions or agenda does it serve? In Afghanistan success, uh, it also serves a purpose, whether domestically or regionally. Um, and that is the question I think that is very critical uh, because we are engaged in a lot of PR and spin right now. Uh, so it serves a purpose for some people to make it look like a total failure. And it is a failure in some ways. I mean, the mission in some ways is a failure. But it's a question of how do we take the next steps and the, the kind of... Uh, leadership that is required and initiatives that are required in order to prevent us from falling into an abyss again. Uh, and the abyss could be uh, civil war, chaos, uh, you know, a, a, a country that is a, a battleground for proxy uh, agendas. That is a failure for Afghans. And so Afghans need to think hard about how do you prevent that from happening? Uh, and how do you turn that around? Also, let's remember, we should never be a step behind reality. It seems to me like in Kabul, a lot of people are a step behind reality and they're also always in reactionary mode instead of become proactive and also own the situation, good or bad, and then try to solve it. The, you know, there's a train that has left the station, 
uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we can, as I said, we can spend months discussing it. But a train has left the station, but that doesn't mean that the American uh, presence or the American engagement is ending. I don't see that. There's still, uh, for at least another few years, there's still a, a, at least $4 billion worth of American money that has been pledged. Now, of course, a lot of things can change that, but that pledge is very serious. And there's no other country in the world that is stepping up to that level. So to to assume that the Americans have no role to play, whether it's in peace or whether it's in development, whether it's in uh, uh, even, uh, God forbid, taking sides in a civil war, which was something that we, you know, we, we should avoid doing, that um, is, is misleading. Uh, every stakeholder has still a role to play. The, the aim should be to, yes, Afghanize the process, <laughs> but we have seen for years that Afghanization of a process is a very difficult task because just look at Kabul, and I'm not sure exactly what else needs to happen in order to, to push the process towards more consensus. Um, so uh, we, we, we really need to understand where we stand and what the opportunity cost is and what the opportunity value is and what can be done and what cannot be done anymore. There are certain things that can no longer be done. Uh, and, and if you do, then you are taking the, the country towards the abyss. And there are certain things that still can be done and need to be done, uh, even if it means sacrificing your position, sacrificing power, sacrificing, you know, all these privileges that you that we have been accustomed to for all these years. We, we need to realize that we do not, will not have a babysitter anymore, even though we haven't, for 20 years, haven't learned to crawl yet. It's very unfortunate to say that, but I have to say it because it's a hard reality to, to master. For 20 years, there was a babysitter or several, and they're leaving partially, uh, and we still don't know how to get up and walk. Uh, and so, so we need to know how to create the environment from now on, which means a peaceful environment to the extent possible through compromise and sacrifice, political sacrifice, that would then allow us to walk again. And, and I think uh, it, it, that's where reality is. We are no longer at the stage in 2014, 15, over time when I was an ambassador to, to discuss, you know, nitty gritties of bilateral trade or this or that. You know, that again, that train has left the station and we got what we got. What we are looking right now is at the survival of a country and a state and, and, and an order and how to reshape the order, how to reshape the state and, and how to keep it cohesive and how to make sure that it doesn't fall apart. That's where we are today, not about how much uh, trade with Pakistan or Iran uh, should we negotiate. Uh, that can come later again. That should be part of a new engagement in a new phase. So I just want to bring everybody back to reality of where we are. We are at a very critical moment, and I hope that we grasp this moment instead of trying to, you know, play these games that really never have worked, never will work, and will make us, you know, take us in, a, in the wrong direction.